as well. But uh, it's, it's really up to you. But in this case here, we're going to be starting with the, the HMI portion of the programming for our timers. So we'll go over here to the left. And the, the first variable that we're going to look at is the, the button. It's under the Shapes menu. You can see on the center pane here. And then just the, the square B. So when you click that button once, you click it a single time, and then you hover over to the HMI. And you'll see now, instead of the standard cursor, we have a crosshair, which allows us to, to draw out the button that we want to be able to use. So I'm just going to click and hold down and drag the button out. And you see that now we have a properties menu. Um, so there's a bunch of different options you can define here. Really, the main ones that you're going to be using are the under the text option here, button. I'll move this down so you can see. But when you type in the text here, I'm just going to call it on 1. You can see it changes on the HMI here as well. You can click the checkbox, which will allow you to, to apply that change. So my text is on 1 for the button. Um, we have the option to have text from the string library as well. Uh, we're not going to go into that today. The string library is a whole other topic in itself, which we'll look at at a later point. Um, the standard options as far as selecting the fonts, and also as well the, the appearance of so the background color of the button. You have the nine options here. Also the text color, the foreground, and then the style, whether you want it to be, to be pressed or flat. Um, those are really just more cosmetic options that you can define. The other important property that we want to assign here is the touch property. So by default, it will just be on mouse click, which really doesn't do a whole lot if you just have it on the HMI screen. Uh, so we're going to want to assign a touch property here. So you just click anywhere in this, this area here where it says mouse click. And we have the option to select an operand and address. Uh, so this is a push button that we're defining. So it's a Boolean value, which is going to be working with our memory bit here. Um, if you click the the little blue text down here, and when I hover over it, you can see it says get next unused address. This button is very handy. It allows you, in our program here, it's a simple program, so it's not, not so critical. But once your program gets more involved, what this button does, it finds the next unavailable used memory bit or integer, whatever, whatever operand type that you're using, really. Uh, but when you click this blue button, it finds the next unused one. So it makes it, it, makes it easier when you're assigning buttons. Uh, to make sure you don't accidentally override one that you've used already. Uh, so when I click this here, it's MB0. We haven't used any memory bits in our program yet. So the first unavailable one that we can use is memory, memory bit number 0. Uh, so when, when you click that button, it assigns us to memory bit 0. You also have the option of punching in whatever number you want here manually as well. I'll put it back to MB0. And the other parameter we have here is the operand description. And this is also, it's not mandatory, it's not required, but it's, it's strongly suggested that you insert a operand description here. Think of it, think of it as a label. Um, it allows you to, to keep better track in your programming to make sure that, that you know what operands are used for what. Again, in the simple program here, it's not so critical. But once your program is more involved, uh, knowing which bit is linked to which will help greatly, whether you're debugging or designing HMI screens, ladder code. Uh, it's really just a good idea to give a label here. So I'm going to also call this memory bit here on button 1. And last option you can see here as well is the power-up condition. Uh, it's next to this little power-up plug here. The two options for the Boolean value, or the three options, I guess, really are none, reset, or set. When you have it to none, uh, it, it just does not use the power-up condition at all. But what the power-up condition is, when you reset power to the controller, you cycle power, you initialize and reset, any options like that, if you have a power-up condition selected, it will automatically store a, a reset or a set to this Boolean value. So if we cycle power and we have reset selected, when we turn the controller back on, the state of MB0 will be 0. If we have it to set, when we turn it on and reset the controller, it will be a, a high state. Um, so with a Boolean, you just really have the on or off selectable. But when you're using a memory integer, for example, or any type of numeric variable, 
it's it's useful as well if you want to have a preset value in there. You can store 123 into MI0, for example. So it just allows you to have a kind of a default value and whenever you cycle power. But in this case here, we're going to leave it on none. I'm going to hit OK. So now we have defined our text, called it on1, assigned a link property of MB0. That's all that we really need to, to do into here. I could talk real quick about the other parameters under here, hide, disable, marking view. Uh, whenever you click these where it says mouse click right now, it's just going to ask you to, to assign uh, another memory bit, a Boolean value there, which will, if it's high, you know, it will hide the variable, disable mode. It will make it so that it's grayed out so you can't actually select it. And marking view is just when it has a, like a highlighting background behind it as well. So those are more advanced parameters. If you want to hide certain portions of your program, you can link it to, to a password, for example, which we'll look at at a later point as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll go into those more later in our webinar series. But for right now, we can just X out of here, and our parameters will be saved for on button one. So we made this on button. What we're going to do with the button, basically, is we're going to turn the timer on, allow it to count down, and then we're going to turn on the light when, when that timer is being has become active when it's when it's finished counting down. So we have the button to press to hold down to turn on the timer, but we want to have some sort of indication for for the timer having expired and having you know set the timer bit. So if you if you watched our first webinar, it's going to be the same sort of thing that we did with the push buttons and the different types of logic. So what we're going to use here under the the image pane you'll see the option that looks like the the little yellow eyeball. It's a binary image or switch so I'm going ahead, gonna go ahead and click this button here. Same thing as a button, you click it once, you hover over onto the HMI screen, and you'll get the crosshairs. So I'm gonna hold down and draw out with the crosshairs. And now I have the, the window open for the binary image. This, this variable allows you to have two different states graphically represented. Uh, so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna link. So we're gonna link it to a Boolean value. I'm going to use the next available here, like we talked about just before. I'm going to call it light output one. So we have this Boolean value, our memory bit one. You can see here there's a zero for the off state image for zero and a one for the on state. So depending on high or low status of this memory bit, we're going to display a different picture. So I'm going to go and hit browse. And let me just say real quick, the default directory, it should open to the images for you automatically in VisiLogic, but if for some reason it does not, it's going to be located. My drive is the E drive where all my, my programs are installed, but most people will be the C drive. Uh, but it's going to be in your program files, Unitronics, VisiLogic underscore C, data, and then images C. So that's, that's the folder where I am right now. This is the, the library of images that's installed by default. When you install VisiLogic, you have these, these different images to be able to utilize in your program. And you can also import custom images as well. But there's a nice library that's included with VisiLogic in this images underscore C folder. So we're going to scroll down here. You can use whatever image you like. I'm just going to use the LEDs window. And for my off state, I'm going to pick the red LED. And for the same thing now, we want to define an image for the, the high state. So I click Browse again. It remembers the last folder that I was in, which is nice. I'm going to click the green button, open that up. So now I've defined a, an image graphical representation for my off, my zero state. You can see it says zero in here. And then I have a picture also for my one state. And one thing, a quick note to say as well, you can see right now it's displaying the green on here. If I click red, it's going to display it on the HMI. It really, on when you're programming in here, it's just going to show the last state that you had clicked for this, for this check button. This really has no bearing on the actual program once it's been downloaded to the controller. But uh, some people ask why, you know, why is mine red and the other person's is green on the HMI. It's really just a result of the last, the last radio button that has been clicked before you hit OK. Um, so we define the memory bit, the link portion for our graphical representation here. 
And uh, I'll talk real quick about the toggle button as well. The toggle button, if you have this checkbox selected, this is basically going to control the state of the, the memory bit that we've assigned as the link without any ladder codes. If you have the toggle button checked here, whenever you use the HMI screen to physically touch this, this graphical variable, it's going to automatically toggle the status of memory bit one from low to high or high to low, you know, which, whichever the previous state was, it's going to toggle that. Um, so if you leave this unchecked, which we're going to do, it's dependent on some other condition within the ladder code. But if you want to avoid some ladder programming and the situation fits, you can have the checkbox selected for toggle. But in our case here, we're not going to be using that. So I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. So right now we have our on button. We have a representation for our light, which we're going to add in the ladder code in a minute. Uh, but one other thing we want to place on the, the HMI screen here is a special type of, of variable that's dedicated to the timers. So in our center pane here again, if we go down to the, the menu for timer and counter, that, that header here, you'll see there's the option for a timer, which just looks like the black square wave there. Uh, if you have a smaller smaller resolution on your monitor, you may have to click a, a drop-down box to get these additional tools. My resolution is large enough where I can display the entire menu here, but some, some people's monitors may cut it off like around the graphs, for example, and you'll see there'll be a little checkbox here where you can open up and select the, the more variables. Uh, but mine's available here, so I'm just going to click timer. Same practice, click it once, draw over and hover. I have the crosshairs. So I'm going to go ahead and draw it out. And now you can see there's the special type of variable timer. Um, so what this allows you to do, it allows you to link directly to one of the pre-programmed timers, and we can display that on the HMI screen. You can also input the value as well. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, the first thing you should always do whenever you open up any type of variable window is really to assign a link to it. So I'm going to click the Browse button for the link down here. Again, I'll just use the next available. We haven't used any yet, so that's timer zero. And I'll give it a label as well. Call it five sec timer. And you can see now when I have the other option down here for timer type. So when I drop down here, you'll see I have the option of TD, TA, or TE. And those stand for timer delay, timer accumulated, and timer elapsed. Um, so we have these three different types of variable, variable timers to work with. Uh, I'll say real quick, there is, there is a section of the help file. I'll open that up real quick to you. You can see here, it explains well the different types of timers. So when you click the, the blue button here as well, you see there's a, a nice little graph here which shows the different the different conditions and the result as far as the, the TD, the time delay, the TA, timer accumulated, and the, the TE. I think I said timer elapsed before, but it is timer extended pulse is the correct terminology for the TE. Um, so it explains well if you want to read these different types. I can say real quick just to summarize the TD timer Basically, it'll always reset back to the preset time, uh, and there's no manual reset required. So when it counts down, it's just going to hop back up to the next, the next preset time automatically, and you don't have to manually reset it. The TA timer, this one will pick back up from the previous current value. So if you stop sending a condition of power flow to the timer, if you break that in the middle of the countdown, it's going to automatically pick back up from the, the previous current value and continue to count down from that previous value. But it does require a reset with a, a reset coil when you are programming that into your logic. And the TE timer, that only requires a single pulse to turn on. The other two types of timers require a constant pulse, um, uh, constant contact flowing with power to it to be able to energize the timer. The TE only requires a single pulse to run. And this one is unique as well in that the bit is on during the run. Uh, the other two are opposite in that regard. But if you read through these descriptions in the help file here, and as well as uh, just take a look and follow these graphs here, it, it helps you understand pretty well the different types of timers. But I'll just say the most common one that you're going to be using most of the time is probably just a TD timer. And that's all we're going to stick with today for the, for the example as well.
So I should just say too, I pulled that up. If you click the search button and search for timers, it will be the second one you have down here as well in the help file. So I just typed in timers before, so I had it open already, but you click in timers. Just click on the, the T here for timers and it explains everything we just looked at. So I'll minimize that now. Back to our link. We're just going to use the, the TD type timer for this example here. The next option you have is format view. You have the option for time or seconds. Um, if you have time, you can see here we have the four different parameters to define. Um, starting at the right most time here, or the right most uh, portion of the colon, it's hundredth of seconds, seconds, minutes, and hours. Uh, so those are the four different parameters, hundredths of seconds, seconds, minutes, and hours that you can define. So I'll put in five seconds here. That's my second parameter. I have a second of five. And right now that's on the time. So we have those four different options to specify hours, minutes, seconds, hundredths of seconds. If I click the drop down here to go to seconds, you'll see now I only can enter in the value here in the, the format of seconds, I guess. So, for example, if I put in 120 here, 120 seconds, when I click back to time, I'll have two, two uh, minutes here. So, I don't want to do that, though. I want to just put it back to five seconds here for demonstration purposes. So, I have it on five seconds here. Again, we have the power-up condition, reset on power-up. Um, whenever you're, in this case here, I'm going to want to have it checked, but again, this is just saying whenever you cycle power to the controller, it's going to make sure that it automatically loads this predefined time into the timer. Uh, if you're doing examples and tests, it's a good idea to have this checked whenever you do a download and reset, just so you don't have a, a previous value stuck in the timer. You might start scratching your head as to why the timer isn't counting down, or why it's not reset, or not the, not the value you, you thought it would be. Uh, so, in general practice, it's a good idea to have this checkbox select for most of your programs. Obviously, there's situations where you don't want to have that, but uh, just as a general rule of thumb, it's a good idea to have that checkbox selected. So, I have my preset power value of five seconds selected in here. Checkbox to reset on power up. Timer zero. Label. I'll hit OK. So, the other options that we have to select here, the type on the left here, type current or preset. Uh, those are the two options that you have. Select current will show on the, the variable. It'll show the current time that the counter is counting down. So it'll show, you know, five, four, three, two, one as the, the current time. If you select preset, that allows us to, to change if we have keypad entry or just display the, the preset time. So the preset time I entered in this case was just five seconds. So if I select preset here, it's going to always show the five seconds on, the, on this variable here. It's useful as well if you select keypad entry, if you want the user to be able to change the, the value of the timer. So you want to make it so they can enter in you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds, whatever, whatever value they desire. They can edit the timer very easily by just selecting the keypad entry. There's no need to use any ladder code or do any sort of time conversion, you know, seconds to whatever. There's, there's no external conversion math required for loading a value into the timer when you do it via the HMI using this keypad entry button. So the last option we have here to select to is the format. Like I was saying before, uh, hours, minutes, seconds, hundreds of seconds. And you can see that's how it's currently being displayed on the HMI. Um, I'll just put it to, to seconds in this case because we're only using seconds anyway. So it's just going to be the format here is really just how it's displayed on the HMI screen. So I have my preset, seconds, I'm not going to select keypad entry here. I have my link to TD0, and I'll hit OK. And we should probably just put one more, one more timer variable on here as well for the current time, just so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to select this, this square wave for the timer variable again. Come over, draw it out. First thing I want to do is assign a link. We're also going to be monitoring here, T0, our five second timer. Hit OK. And I'm going to leave it on current this time. 
And when you have current selected, you see there's also the option for remaining time or elapsed time. Uh, those are what they say. And I'll select for format in this time seconds and hundredths of seconds. Hit OK. So just to recap real quick, we have our on button, which we're going to press to activate our timer. When the timer's done, we'll see the light come on. And these two windows as well will show the preset time, which is just going to be five seconds. And then also the, the current time that it's counting down from. Are there any questions on that so far? OK, um, if not, we will continue on them. This is all we're going to set up for the, the HMI portion right now. So we'll go over to the main routine. And we'll start working with the, the ladder code. Um, it's always a good idea when you're programming in the ladder code here to include comments in your program. Uh, Visiologic makes it relatively easy to do that, to insert a comment. Uh, you do that by clicking the, the yellow dialog box down here to insert comment. So when you click that once, you'll see you have crosshairs. And whatever net you click in, it's just going to insert the window right above it. And I'm just going to call this timer one, just so we can organize our program a little bit better. Um, and it's always a good practice, like I said, to have this. Whenever somebody else is looking at your software or trying to figure out what's going on in the program, comments do help immensely. So in the first net here, we're going to start off by using a direct contact. I'm going to click that from the center pane. You can also just hit F5 if you like to grab that as well. But when you click that, you'll see over here, I can drop that down right on the left hand, left hand portion of the rail. And in this case here, you see we have to link it. Um, we're not going to use next available this time. We're actually going to link it to the button that we created on the HMI. Um, you probably remember it was MB0 because we don't have a whole lot going on in the program here. But another nice feature as well, if you click the drop down box here, you can see all of the operands that have been in use so far. So if you give your, your operands good descriptions, good labels, you can see when you click this drop down box, if you forget what you're using or which you assign to which, it's a good idea to click this drop down box. And you can see all the different variables that are, whether they're in use with the checkbox. And also if you give them the description, it makes it even easier as well. Um, so you can see all the ones that you've used. If you just click it here, I'm going to click on button one. It automatically selects that for us. Our MB0 is our on button one. And then we can just hit OK. So we're saying when we push the button here, we're going to energize this contact and have power flow through it. So we want to have power flow through to energize our timer that we just created. Um, so we're going to use a direct coil here under the center pane. And I'll bring that out and connect it in series with our push button. So again, um, by default, it opens up to MB. You can see the drop downs we have here, our on button and our light output, but we don't want to use our memory bits here. What we actually want to do is link it to a timer. So when you click this little drop down dialog box right next to MB, you'll see the, all the different Boolean types you can select as well as the timer. Um, memory bits, our X bits, which are our fast memory bits, our system bits, our physical outputs, are also timers. Um, so we'll just use the timer right now. And again, you can, you can drag down here to select our five second timer, our T0, and all these settings still remain preserved from when we define them on the HMI. It is all integrated, so it's, it's saved whether you go into the latter portion or the HMI portion. So our T0, five second timer, power up value of five has been saved. I'll just click OK. And in our next net below, we're going to insert another direct contact. And this time, we are actually going to link it again to our T0. So whenever you use a timer with the unitronics, it's basically at least a two, a two net 
process. You have to have two nets to be able to control the timer. Um, so in our first net here, we'll just recap real quick. When we hold down our push button on the HMI or on button one, it's going to energize power through this contact and enable the timer, the timer coil here. And once this timer coil counts down from the five seconds, there's actually an internal bit associated with each of the timers. So this, this TD0 bit is going to go high um, once, once the timer has finished counting down and has finished its, its count. So you want to have the, the condition enabling the timer in one net, and then the net right below, you want to have some sort of result. So when the timer finishes, power is going to flow through this TD0 bit. And in our case here, we're going to use a direct coil and place it right in series. And this time, we're going to link it to our light output. So I can drop down. See, I use MB0 as my light output 1. Hit OK. And now these two nets here are, are really the only, the only thing that's required to have this, this type of countdown timer. So I'm going to go ahead and download this now, actually. Um, so to download a program, it's the connection menu and then download and stop download and reset. Before we go there though, I just want to say from the connection menu, the last option you can see is communication and OS. In this menu here, this is where you define the, the communication link to the controller. I'm using a, a serial USB adapter which is installed on COM port number three and I'm using a Vision 570 controller so the maximum baud rate of uh, 115,200 will will do well. Um, if you're using any of the standard series controllers, 57K is the max, but any of the enhanced Vision 570, 350, 130, 560, or 1040 controllers, you can use the maximum baud rate. And if I click Get OPLC Information, you can see right now I have a 570 controller connected with the latest operating system 3.1 bracket 30. So I know I have a good communication link, so I'll go back up to the connection menu, download, stop, download, and reset. There's four different options you can see here. Uh, download, it will just download the program um, and leave the controller in run mode. The second option will actually download the program to the controller and then cycle power on the PLC. Uh, so it's a good practice to get into doing the stop, download, and reset, especially if you have any type of power up conditions assigned. Um, you want to do the stop, down, and reload, and reset to make sure you have those, those power up conditions will get, will get pulsed when the power cycles. Last two options, download and burn. It will back up the, the program to the EEPROM. So if, you, if your battery backup dies, for example, you'll still have it burned, burned into the memory. Um, and burn upload project, it just allows somebody to be able to, con to pull the controllers program off if you happen to lose your VLP VisiLogic project file. Uh, but in this case, we're just going to do a stop, download, and reset. And it'll just take a minute here. It's probably going to tell you that you have a different program installed already on the, the PLC. But you know what we're doing here. It's more of just a warning to make sure you, you don't overwrite something accidentally. But you can just hit yes to that. And as well, it's going to warn you that your images are different. I know what I'm doing here, so I'm just going to hit yes. Okay, so I've downloaded my program. I'm going to go into online test mode here so you guys can see what's going on at my desk as well. Uh, from the connection menu, you can click online test mode. And once you're in online test mode, you can see here I have red lines. If I go to the view menu and then remote access, I'll actually be able to pull up my PLC screen. So this is what I'm looking at right now. If I hold down my on button, you can see the timer. It starts counting down. And once it, really, once it reaches the, 
the value of zero, it's counted down from five seconds, the light turns on. Once I release my finger, the output will go off. And if I hit it again, you'll see it starts counting down from the preset. If I release midpoint, it'll stop. And then when I hit the button again, it'll start counting from the, the five seconds again. Uh, so that's, that's the inherent property of the type TD timer. Are there any questions on that? Okay, um, we will continue moving on then. I'll just hop off of online test mode and I'll go back to the, the HMI as well. We'll take a look at one more type of timer, or not a type, I guess, but a different method of implementing the timer. Uh, so same procedure as before. We're going to place the button on the screen. I'm going to give it the text and call this one on2. and assign a touch property as well to the next available, MB2 in this case. And I'll call it my on button 2. So I just gave it the text for on2, assigned a touch property for MB2 here. And that's all that we really need. I'll move this guy up. And now as well, I'll add another binary image switch as an indicator light. Oop, I need to draw that out. There we go. Okay, so I'll assign a link property. Next available as well happens to be MB3. Call it light output 2. And just assign a, a image for my off and my on state. And hit OK. That's so weird. I put them in. And real quick as well, we'll put a another type variable timer. And we don't need to have the, the preset again, so we'll just do current this time. And we'll do minutes, seconds, hundreds of seconds. Assign the link. We want to use the next available timer here, which is going to be T1. And I'll just call it timer 2. And I'll give it 6 seconds this time. Power up. So we're really just going to be displaying the current time of our timer number one on the HMI screen this time. So hit OK. And let me say what we're actually going to do as well. Before you noticed um, you had to hold down this on button, the timer would count down, and then the light would come on. But if you release the button at any point, the timer stops counting down. So I mean, there are certain instances where that's good. But what if you want to have it so you push the button one time, a certain condition one time, uh, then you want the, the output to be on and the timer to count down and then have the, the output shut off once the timer has expired. Um, so we're going to do that this time. So making it, you only have to push the button once. It's going to turn on our output, count down, and as soon as we finish counting down, uh, we'll, we'll shut that output off. So that's, that's all that we need for the HMI here, our button to press one time, our light to indicate that we're on, and just so we know where we are as far as the timer counting down, we'll have the current variable timer window as well. So over to the ladder now. I'm just going to minimize these by double clicking so I have more screen space. And also insert a comment. Call this my timer 2. Now, um, I said we're going to push it one time. So to do that, we're going to use a one-shot type of contact, a positive transition contact. Uh, you can find this 
Also under the Boolean menu, Contacts and Positive Transition. So what this is going to do, basically, once we hit the, the button a single time, the, the contact here is going to recognize the, the rise of the bit associated, and it's going to only do that for the, the single scan. So I'm going to place that down. Again, I'll look on my drop-down list here, and I want to link it to my on button number two, and hit OK. Now, I, I said I wanted to make it so you can push the button one time, have the output turn on, and then the timer is going to count down, and once the timer counts down, we're going to shut the, the light off. So, to make that happen, uh, instead of a direct coil this time, we're going to use a set coil. Again, you can just grab that on the middle here, or also under the Boolean menu. I'll place that in series. And we're going to link this here to our light output too or MB3. So let me talk about set coils real quick. Um, there used to be you had to use a latching circuit if you wanted to have a, a type of hold, a hold action, um, but we do have set and reset coils in Visiologic here, which they only require a single shot condition, a single scan, you know, for example, positive transition button press to enable the set coil. So the set or the reset coils only need to be pulsed for a single scan and then they will hold their state until they're manually changed. So if you pulse the set coil here, it's going to hold its state, it's going to stay set until there is actually a reset coil somewhere in the program to, to have that go back to its low low state. Um, so it's a set and a hold, basically. Uh, so there's no latching circuit required. It's, it's built in with these type of set and reset coils. So we have our button we're going to press. We're going to set our, our light output. So the next element is going to be a direct contact, which will be placed in the net right below. So we still need we still need some constant condition to energize our timer for it to count down. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to use our light output number two as the enabling condition to energize the, the timer number two coil. So we're going to push the button. It's going to set the output here, which is going to be on allowing power to flow through MB3 here since it's in the on state. And then the other element we need is a direct coil, which is going to be our timer that's energized by the light output too. So in this case, our T1, well, I named it timer 2, which is maybe a little bit confusing. Um, let me just change that real quick to 6 sec timer. It's really just a label, so it's not relevant to any type of programming, but it just makes things a little more confusing otherwise. Um, so we're going to energize our, our timer here as long as the light is on. Now, once the timer counts down, we'll, we will use a positive transition contact this time in the net right below. And here, it's going to go to our, our TD1. Hit OK. So the timer is being energized. Once the timer is finished counting down from at six seconds, the internal bit will go high, which is going to be recognized in net five here by the positive transition contact. And what we want to do then is shut off our output. So we're going to shut off the light, which also therefore kills power to the timer. Um, so that's, that's how this is going to work here. Um, so this is just going to be linked to our light output two, which is also MV3. So this is really a type of a type of set and hold circuit. Here we're using a timer, um, but whenever you're using any sort of any sort of uh, communication program, for example, um, you want to ensure that the the communications is sent properly. It's a good procedure to have this this two net type of process to uh, set with a, a single set coil, enable condition in the net right below. Do whatever you want to do in this case in this case counting down with a timer, um, and then reset that that uh, enabler once you've completed the task. Um, so this, this type of timer, it is a three net process, but it allows you to count down with a single pulse, um, have the timer count down, and then reset that once we're done. So we'll go ahead and download this real quick. And it's telling us here that the timer value is different than what's previous in the controller. That's okay. We know what we're doing here, so we'll hit continue. Five, 
as well. The images are different since we added that, that light output too. So I'm just going to hit yes. And it's ready to go, so I'll hit OK. Now let me hop into online test mode so you can see what's going on as well. Again, I'll pull up remote access under the view menu and then remote access. OK, so this is kind of nice to do when you're testing as well. You can have the ladder open simultaneous with the screen. So you can see on the ladder code here as well, once I push the on number two, the set coil goes red, the output means the output is high, you can see the light indicator as well. Um, the timer counts down and then the, the light shuts off. You can see here as well the current time is counting down from six seconds. Once it expires, the bit goes high for the timer, which then in fact resets the, the light output. So this is really a three net process versus the previous two net, but it allows you to have a, a type of set and hold for your timers. Are there any questions on that? Okay, no questions means that uh, all is clear, which I guess it is, or maybe nothing is clear, so you don't know what to ask. What is the situation? Is it all clear here? I guess so. I guess so too. <laughs> so, now let's continue. I'm here to answer the questions. So, uh, all clear. Thank you. OK, and uh, I know we're going a little bit fast here as well, but um, I do plan on having these up on the web hopefully next week so you can go back and review it at a later point as well. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, just continue to, or go ahead and ask them, Emil will be able to answer, and uh, that's really better that you understand what's going on. Uh, so Emil is here to answer as well. But if there's no questions at the moment, we'll continue, and uh, we'll take a look at one last type of timer. Uh, so we'll go back to the HMI portion, and you can see here we are out of HMI out of HMI real estate here. We don't have any more screen space to be able to utilize. Uh, so I'm going to show you now a method to be able to navigate between HMI screens um, so we can go back and forth and add an additional screen. So the first thing that we are going to do is when you are on the HMI portion on the left here and select the, the drop down here, see the different HMIs that we have. But what I want to do is right click on startup display and then we have a couple options here, but what I'm going to use now is add new display. And you can see here, it uh, gave me a second one down here, and I can insert a label for it. The default is just display one, two, three, but uh, you can give whatever name you like for it. Um, I'll just call it screen two. So now I have my two HMI screens, but I want to have some sort of method to be able to navigate between them. So um, we're going to insert a button on our first screen here to be able us to, to click back and forth. So like before, just the, the button with the square B. I'll place it down on the, the bottom right-hand portion of the screen. I'll give it a, a name, or I'll just insert the, the carrots or the, the slashes here, whatever they're called. Um, and then under touch properties, we want to assign a memory bit as well. Next available. I'll call it nav to screen to. So just the touch property gave it the, the arrows showing that we're going to navigate. And we'll say right in this case. So touch property on the button is the main, the main idea here. Now in VisiLogic, there's two different ways that you can navigate uh, between your HMIs. You can do it via the ladder code. There's function blocks for that. You can insert the, the ladder logic if you'd like. But what's really almost easier, uh, they're built into the HMI portion of the screen here, 
there's these jump conditions you can see on the bottom left here. So it allows you to go between your different screens without any actual programming code in the ladder logic. So it's very useful. Uh, it makes it quite a bit faster. But again, you can do it either method that you like. If you have a preference, it doesn't matter. They both will essentially function the same way. Uh, you can make them function the same way. So we'll just use the HMI portion here since we're right here already. Two parameters you have to define are the jump condition and then the display that you want to jump to. So if you click in the jump condition area here, you'll see that there will be a, a square box that pops up. This browse button here, once you click in the number one, you got the browse button. Then I can click the browse and like it's looked before. We want to assign a memory bit as our touch property, basically, to, to allow us to go. So I'll go on the drop-down list and select my MB4, which is my nav to screen 2, and then hit OK. So you can see also there's a little bit, there's an image here of a positive transition contact, which is essentially what we're doing. So the positive transition of our button press, MB4, um, is going to enable our jump condition and we're going to go to the display that we choose. Uh, same, same process as before. You click anywhere in the white space here. You get the little browse button. And then I click the square. Now I have the option to, to select which screen I want to go to. I'm going to pick screen 2 in this case and hit OK. So that's, that's really all that you have to do to be able to, to jump between screens. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of different, uh, you have up to 16 different jump conditions you can do. So you can jump to 16 different screens via the HMI here. If for some reason you do need more, you can always implement it with a ladder code as well. So it's not like you're only locked to 16. You can also utilize the ladder code as well. Um, so, so we're able to have our button here to go to our screen 2. So I'll just click screen 2 now. And we'll go ahead and do the same thing. So we're on screen two, but we want to have a, a method to be able to get back to our, our original screen. So I'll just pick the, the button here, draw that out on the screen as well. Same thing, I'll put the, ar the uh, arrows going back. And assign a touch property as well. I'll use the next available here, MB5. And call it nav to startup display. So that's the same as before. And the jump condition this time, I click, get the browse button. I will see the drop down. And we have nav to startup display. So I'll click OK. And the display window here as well. I click once on the, the white line. It opens up then the option to click the Browse button. I click the Browse button. And this time I'm going to select Startup Display and hit OK. So we just have the, the button, Touch Property, assigned to MB5 in this case. The HMI will automatically program here, MB5, Positive Transition. We will jump to the Startup Display. And that, that allows us to navigate between uh, multiple HMI screens, all done via the, the HMI programming portion here, no ladder code required. Are there any questions on that so far? As far as navigating between the screens, jump conditions, it's, it's OK? All right. Um, well, we'll look at the last type of or method for timers here. Uh, same as before, we'll insert a binary image switch. I'll make this one big because it's our only going to be our one on the screen. So assign a link property. I'll use the next available, MB6 in this case, and I'll call it light output 3. And as well, the image for the zero state. I'll follow what I've been doing before with the red 
for the off and the green for the on. And just hit OK. So we're going to have our one big indicator light on the screen this time. Um, and we won't bother putting any any other uh, variable timers on it for this case. So we'll go to the main routine. Again, I'm just going to double click here to minimize these down so you can get more, more on my screen for you to see. And I'll put my comment with the yellow dialog box. Click in net 6 will give me the the comments window right above that net. And I'll call it timer 3. Okay, so the, the previous two methods for implementing the timer that we have used required either holding down the button or pressing the button a single time. But if for some reason you want a timer to just always be continuously you know, counting down for five seconds and then doing whatever it's assigned to do, whatever condition output you want to utilize, and then have it count down again uh, right away. So we're going to make a timer that's constantly counting down um, all the time. So to do that, we will use this time an inverted contact um, available under the center pane here, or also the Boolean contacts and inverted contact. So I'll place that down on the rail. And we're going to want to do our drop down and go to timer. And we'll do the, the next available, which is T2. Uh, we'll call this one 2-sec timer. Reset on power up. I'll check that and enter in a, a value of 2 seconds here as well. Hit OK. So we have an inverted contact here. We'll place a direct coil in series with that. And it's also going to be linked to our T2, or our two-second timer. So what we're saying here, we're using an inverted contact. So that allows power to flow whenever the, the condition is low. So whenever the timer bit is, the timer bit is low, uh, it's not active. That means it's still counting down. So this net is going to allow us to be able to count down, enable, energize the, the timer here, so long as it's not currently active. Um, so this, this inverted contact and then the direct coil allows us to have a timer that's, that's continuously s cycling back and forth and counting down. Um, you know, the bit goes high, it does its condition, and then we're going to just start over and do it all again. Um, so the net right below it, we want to have some, some indication that the timer is counted down. So we'll use our, our positive transition contact again, place that right onto the rail, and again, drop down. T2, so our, our two second timer. And I'll hit OK. Now, um, we'll use in this case a different type of coil. Uh, if you go to the Boolean menu and then coils, uh, we've used, or we've talked about most of these before. Direct inverted is just the opposite of direct. Um, set and reset we looked at previously. The last option is toggle coil. I'm going to select that and place it in series with net 7. And in this case, I'm going to select my light output 3 and hit OK. So what the toggle coil does, as you can probably guess, it basically just changes the state. We talked about the toggle built into the, the uh, binary image switch before when you click that checkbox. There's also the toggle coil that you can select, which we just placed in. And whatever the previous state is, it's just going to change that, whether it's from high to low or low to high. That's what the, the toggle coil does here. So what this timer essentially is going to be doing is um, when the timer is not, the bit is not active, Timer is going to be energized, countdown. Once the timer is finished counting down, the timer bit will go high for that single scan, which is detected by this positive transition contact. And then we're going to go ahead and toggle our, our light output um, and then just do it all over again with the inverted contact here. So I'm going to go ahead and download that now with the stop, download, and reset.
Continue here. Okay, so we have a question about the the preset, the timer. Uh, we'll talk about that in one second. I just wanted to show show what we have done here with this uh, with this toggle coil. So let me hop into online test mode. And I will bring up the remote access. OK, so we're on our original startup display screen. And you can see the button is now on the bottom right hand side. Once I push that, it'll bring me to my second HMI screen. And I'm not pressing anything on the screen at all right now. Um, but you can see the button is, is just toggling back and forth as per this, this timer um, coil here. And I guess one other thing I could show you too, if you, if you ever click on anywhere where it says TD whatever, whether it's a coil or a contact, when you click the yellow portion above, it will open up the timer window, which in this case we could see it's just continuously counting down from two seconds. Uh, the current time is in green. You can see the preset stays at two seconds. Um, this is where you can also enter in a new value for the timer as well if you wanted to. Um, you can do it right from online test mode. But somebody also asked about changing that from the HMI. So let me hop off online test mode and we'll go back and do that real quick. Uh, I guess we'll do it with we'll do it with our first timer. Um, so we have our preset window already in here. So open up. Yes. Yes. Sorry, can you make the view of the preset value unpressed so it will make the sense of a button? I think it will be more elegant. Just a suggestion. Okay. Let's uh, do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in the in the option here, uh, we were seeing there's the the keypad entry. So you just have to be able to click that. And I'll just show you real quick too. If you click the the preview here, it shows you the the on-screen keyboard is going to to pop up automatically on your HMI screen. So once you once you click that, it allows you to to um, enter in the time you want. But I won't do that right here. Um, I'll just add another one for our second timer. So I'll go back and add a, a square wave here for our timer counter variable. Draw that out. And we'll change it to the preset. Link it to our timer one, which is our six second timer, which is associated with this whole second net here. And I'll pick keypad entry. Um, like I pointed out before, there's the three different keyboard types. Uh, when you have complex, I guess I didn't explain the difference, but complex allows you to have the, the hex characters on the bottom as well. Um, we don't really need that for the timer, so I'll just select simple uh, with the delete key or the backspace key are the two options you have. But it's kind of nice. It gives you a little bit bigger buttons as well. So if you have operators with, with bigger fingers, uh, having a simple keyboard just gives you a little bit larger physical button size on the controller screen for them to press. Um, and again, you can specify, I'll just put it to seconds here. Uh, it'll make it easier. So we've linked it to our, our uh, TD1, our six second timer. 
and I've selected preset, keypad entry, simple type of keyboard, and hit OK. One second, let's change this style to press it, to unpress it. Oh, th okay, that's what you're saying, all right, yeah. So this will make the sense of a button, so it's more uh, intuitive. Okay, yes, yes, you're correct. Okay. Yep, so that's... It's just a matter of elegance. Yeah, yeah, there's the different options you can pick under style. Um, you can do flat or unpressed or pressed, but uh, like Emil was saying, it's easier to differentiate it, um, to have it as the unpressed, so meaning they have to push push the button, uh, so we follow our, our other conventions. And we'll hit OK. Drag that out. All right, so I will download this real quick now. Okay, uh, let me pull this up now. Online test mode. Okay, so we can see that the, the previous value for the preset we had it set, saved at 6, so that's what it stayed at. When I click this push button now, you can see it's going to come up to 6 seconds, but this is where the on-screen keypad allows us to change it. So I'll make it 11 seconds and hit Enter. So now when I hit On, you can see down here it changed automatically to start counting down from 11. The light is still on for 11. and it counts down, the light shuts off. I can go back if I want to make it, you know, four, not 41, we don't want to do that. We want to make it uh, four seconds. Hit enter, and I'll hit the on button two again. This time it counts down from four seconds. So it's relatively easy to implement uh, this, this on-screen keyboard for presetting your timer with a keypad entry. Are there any questions on that? Okay, that's that's uh, about all I have as far as timers for today's session. Uh, if there are any questions in, in general about what we've done today or anything previously, now would be a good time to, to field those questions. I see there's one here about uh, I tried to use the same memory bit to jump to a new screen and then simultaneously perform another function programmed in the ladder. I'm just answering it. I'm typing the answer. Okay, you so want to go ahead and answer seconds. now? Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe I can answer by microphone if you are here. So uh, when we define, first of all, when we define a touch element, uh, when we link a memory uh, bit to a touch element, it starts to run as a hardware, so it runs as an input, so we cannot use the same element twice linked as touch element to two operands, and we cannot use this uh, memory bit as a coil, because it operates like an input, so the input is pressing uh, the button. This is one thing. The second thing, if you use the memory bit as a, a, a link to a push button, to perform jump. So uh, it operates as positive transition, and when it performs jump and goes to another display, the operating system of the controller resets it. That's why I guess I don't know what exactly when they did uh, 
in ladder, I cannot see her ladder, but I guess this is the reason why it doesn't work the push button in ladder. Is it clear the answer, Wendy? It's okay? Okay, I guess we have another question here. Okay, uh, Andrea, thank you. Do thank you, Wendy. Thank you. So, uh, one second. Once again, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, if there's if there's no more questions, then um, I guess we can okay. we can end it up here. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys all for listening in and attending. Uh, and like I said at some point earlier, uh, I do plan to have this up on the web. Um, you can check out our forum. Uh, it's not implemented yet, but on the Unitronics forum, we do plan to have a write-up of what we discussed today. Also, a, a YouTube link to the, the video recording. Um, assuming this recording worked, but I think it should. Uh, so we should have a, a kind of a, a knowledge database of this, this current webinar, as well as all the previous ones. should be up soon, and again, that's going to be posted on our forum. Um, so if you don't know how to get there, it's just on the Unitronics.com website. And then you can go to the support tab, and forum is the, the option on the bottom that you can select to bring you to our forum. And uh, that's where we are going to be placing this, this webinar information. Uh, there's no section yet, but hopefully uh, come next week, we should have, have something up there for you to go back and reference as far as this. But uh, otherwise, thank you. And uh, if you have any other questions or if you have any feedback, uh, just go ahead and send that to support at unitronics.com. We'd be happy to hear any, any suggestions or feedback that you may have, as well as any other questions in general. And uh, thank you, and I'd like to thank Emil as well for sitting in and helping me. And uh, okay. have thank a nice you. day. Thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure. And thank you to all attendees. Welcome to the next webinar. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I should say, too, that we, we are planning to have these um, quite frequently. I believe our, our next scheduled one, it's not going to be until, until January now. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but uh, we are going to be sending out information about those webinars. It should be starting the, the second week in, in January, but uh, we'll have more information about that as far as the topics. And actually, I, the schedule is on our forum as well. If you go to the forum and then there's the calendar sections, I did just enter those in yesterday. I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. But on our forum and the calendar section, it's, it's listed with all the topics as well as the, the dates. It's going to be on Wednesdays, but all that information is on the forum as well under the calendar. And you can also always uh, just send an email to holly.dillon at unitronics.com. She has all that wealth of information as well and can help you out. But uh, otherwise, thank you and have a nice day or night, depending where you are, I guess. <laughs> uh, Jess, there are some questions here. When the next webinar uh, will be and where the, uh, when the, uh, one second, when the data will be available. Uh, there are a lot of uh, thank you, so I want to thank you too to all participants. Uh, can you answer those two questions? Yes, one second. Um, I'm trying to pull up the, the schedule here on our forum. Oh, I just have a message from Holly, uh, which says, uh, if interested to, to January webinars, please email to uh, Holly uh, that uh, Dylan uh, at Unitronics.com. I hope that all you know the uh, email of uh, Holly Dillon. In the worst case, please send an email to uh, support at unitronics.com and we will pass it to Holly so she will take care. And I just have up on my screen right now too. I hope you can still see it. Um, there's the, the Unitronics form and on the calendar here as well, I placed those. You can click view event and it will show the next one is actually on January 12th. 2011, and it's going to be about uh, data tables and data logging, and that's actually kind of unique. It's a, a two-part series. Um, let's go back to the next month. So uh, the first half we're going to be doing um, building data tables, and then the, the second sec 
the second session is going to be using data export and just continuing. So if you plan on tuning into the 19th, it's suggested that you that you listen on the 12th as well, because uh, it's going to kind of build on the the previous session. Um, and as far as where and when the information about the webinar is going to be posted. Um, and it's going to be somewhere under the forum section here. Uh, I'm going to try to create a, a new new topic completely as far as forum, uh, but I just have to work with somebody on that as well. But it's going to be somewhere up in here, and you won't be able to miss it really. Um, so I'm going to try to get that hopefully by the beginning of next week to have, have something up and, and running with that. Uh, I just have to work with the person who, who moderates our forum to have that have that put into place as a definite. Uh, but definitely, hopefully by next week sometime, we should have more information for you at least about where and when it will be available. Okay, otherwise, uh, thank you guys, and I'm going to be closing the session right now.